Amen. He's a great God. He's a great God. The disciples were out on that ship. The storm came in and about to sink that boat. And they woke up the master. Do you not even care that we perish? You know that we're, we're in this storm. The Bible said that Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves. And everything just sat down. And the disciples looked at each other and said, What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. He's a great God. Praise the Lord. Man, if our ushers could come tonight, receive the evening tithe and offering. Tonight, right after the service, just for a few minutes, maybe five, ten minutes, ten minutes max, we're going to have a quick meeting for East Texas Youth Conference, just going over a few things with the church as a whole. So stay with us just for a few minutes. And then I want to announce that the services will be 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Brother Kenny Morris will open it up. Really, Brother Marsha Atcock with us tonight from Douglas, Georgia. Let's give him a hand of appreciation for coming all the way from Georgia to minister to us tonight. He's really opening it up. But Thursday night, Brother Kenny, and then Friday, Thursday morning, Brother Jeremy Prohaska. And then Friday night, or did I say Friday morning? Thursday morning. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Caught myself coming and going a couple times this week. You have to understand. So Thursday night, 7 p.m., Friday morning, 10 a.m., Jeremy Prohaska, 7 p.m., Friday night, Brother Kenny Morris, and then Brother Noah Hatfield will be with us 10 a.m. Saturday morning. And then my friend from the panhandle of Florida, Brother Don Schutz, is going to be here, and we always have a good time with Brother Don Schutz. He's going to be with us Sunday morning and Sunday night, so come expect him. Don't get wore out during East Texas Youth Conference. We, we, don't, want to, we don't want to fizzle by Sunday. We're going to come in here expecting God to move in this house. Thank you so much for giving. Thank you so much for working and praying and getting ready for this conference. It takes an army to put on a conference like this conference that we're having. And you have worked. I just can't say enough about everything that has happened in the last few days. And our school of ministry has really, really put on. Uh, I mean, they have worked and worked and worked. Thank you, school of ministry. We have a we have a large group of people coming. So what we have done, we're going to get everybody in this building that we can get in this building. We'll talk about that a little bit more after the service tonight. But we do have an overflow room, and you can take a look at it here in the fellowship hall. We want to get everybody in here that's possible. So uh, we, we did get... Last year, we got over 800 in this building and in that fellowship hall seated all the way out there. It was over 800 people. Uh, so we'll have to do it again. And then if we had more, then we could we could go in this next room. I think there were some in this room last year. There were some in the room last year. So thank you so much. This is all about the youth. And you have shown your generosity and your selflessness through every conference that we have. Thank you so much. Be in prayer, God's. I, I just feel we got a breakthrough Sunday night, didn't we? Wow, what a breakthrough. We had church. Praise the Lord. And it's, it's just now just broke open. We're, we're about to see some great things this week. Amen. Brother Kenneth McDaniel, can you bless the offering?
Jesus, cause you were the voice in the desert, you're calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me, you are my rescue story, you lift me beyond from the ashes, and carry my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. my testimony he rescued me I was in seeking sand and he pulled me out thank God thank you musicians and singers we are not going to be dismissing for class tonight we want everyone to stay in here you know my story I was born in Tyler Texas and then about two years of age we are a year and a half two years of age we moved to Texas or Mississippi rather and um I stayed in Mississippi till I was 15 years of age, and then we moved back to Tyler. And it's interesting. I, I wasn't saved until I turned 20. And after I got saved, and I've, I've met so many ministers across the country, I, I have so many friends, so many great brothers and sisters across the country, but it just seems like all roads lead back to the state of Mississippi. Brother, Brother Marshall Adcock here has pastored in, 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 George, in Douglas, Georgia for 22 years, 22 years. But he's from Ellisville, Mississippi, and he went to Brother Kenny Morris's church. And that's right down the road from where I was raised. And just I have already have just a, such a kinder spirit with Brother Marshall. Come preach to us, brother. I'll tell you, my favorite preachers, I think they're from Mississippi. Praise the Lord. What an honor it is to be here. On a Wednesday night. You know, God still moves on Wednesday night. Praise God. I I, I got tickled. You, you can tell Brother Kenny I said this when he, he is my pastor, by the way. He was uh he had to he 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 knew me B C before Christ. He knew me before Christ. And uh I, I, I may have gave him a run for his money, but he hung in there with me until I got until I found Jesus. Amen. 
And then he didn't leave me then. He discipled me and helped me, and, uh, and I appreciate that. But I was asking him one time, I said, Brother Kenny, who's your favorite preacher? That's dangerous to ask the general that. And uh, in the way that only Brother Kenny can, he said, well, I just tell you, son, when God anoints me just right, I'd just soon hear myself preach as I had anybody. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So I'm praying for that kind of anointing tonight. Amen. So maybe I could amen myself for it. So with what an honor it is to finally get to be here. I, 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 told, I told Brother brother Matt, I said, I want, I've been wanting to come. Brother Kenny's been telling me about it and other ministers that have come. And uh, I said, I didn't necessarily have to preach to come, but he called. And I said, well, that's a good reason to go. So here we are. And I already enjoyed the conversations with him. And, and uh, that little uh, church on Edward Street in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, they, uh, uh, when I pastored it, it, was, it, it, it had just, there was just very few people there. But uh, they, I didn't have much of a church, but they didn't have much of a pastor. So uh, we fit good together at that time, amen. And, uh, and, and, but I, I, I loved uh, Brother Anthony Jackson, the one that... Uh, really kind of pioneered that church. It was it was there, but there prior, but he's the one that really brought it out and did a great work for God. Left us way too early. I think 31 years old, died with cancer. Uh, but he was a gr great man of God, great friend of mine, and uh, it blew my mind a while ago when Brother Matt told me, he said, man, I, Anthony Jackson was my pastor. I thought, well, this world's getting smaller by the minute. Amen. I didn't get with the sound, folks. We're going to be in Job chapter number 36. Job chapter number 36, and also we're going to be reading some in Psalms chapter 34, verse 3 is going to be uh, in, our, in our text tonight. Let me, let me give you a little, <clears throat> little, little history about the way I came to this message tonight. I left, I, I don't know if we got any hunters in here, but I, I left to bow hunt. I, I, that's all I do. I don't. I hadn't carried a rifle in about seven or eight years, and and I, I left to bow hunt. And I was going in, into my stand just a few weeks ago, and uh, and and I, I carry my binoculars every time I go, <clears throat> and I and I patted my chest to make sure my binoculars were there. And as I did that, I heard the Spirit of God whisper to me. He said, "Oh, come." Let us magnify the Lord together. Did you know we're not opposing individuals? We're the church. And when you get the church stirred up and you get the church focused, it's untold what God can do through the church. It's the only thing that he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We got work to do, church. And we ought to wade off into it understanding that we have the victory. Amen. We don't need to timidly walk. We don't need to timidly live in this world. We need to advance the kingdom of God if we have to do it right smack through the middle of the kingdom of darkness. Amen. God's going to help us here tonight. Job chapter 36 we're going to begin reading with verse number 22. Job chapter 36, verses 22 through 26. If you don't mind, stand for the reading of his word. <clears throat> then we'll be going to Psalms chapter 34, verse 3. Listen closely. Behold, God exalted by his power, who teacheth like him, who hath enjoined him his way. Or who can say thou hast wrought iniquity? Listen closely to verse 24. Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. The psalm is said in Psalms 34 and 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. 
Let's read that in unison. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation. Let's pray one more time. Ask God to have his will and way here. Father, I love you. I'm thankful for the privilege to stand in this sacred place. <clears throat> God, I realize that in my own ability, there's nothing. Hallelujah. But God, I know that when you come and when you're in the midst, God, I know strongholds can come down. I know walls can crumble. I know lives can be saved and empty vessels can be filled and chains can fall off. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, for a few minutes here tonight that you would anoint your servant. Use me for your glory. And God, because I'm going to give you all the glory for it, for anything that is done. And all God's people said amen and amen. I appreciate you so much. God bless you. Uh, I appreciate this school of ministry. We had them and uh, with us for a couple of nights in a row, and we had church both nights, didn't we? We had church. God moved, and uh, one night we didn't. Even, we never made it to the message. We just made it to the altar. It was wonderful. Amen. As I said a while ago, I, I, I'm an avid hunter. I, I don't. I don't let it get in the way of of, of doing work for the kingdom. And I'll tell you a little story about that. I. One year I was getting ready for bow season. Bow season opens about the middle of September in South Georgia, and it is 500 hot in the middle of September in South Georgia. And and I I, I was I did a lot of preparation one year, a lot of scouting, and 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 the night before bow season opened, I had spent evidently too much time getting ready to hunt, and I was down praying, and the Lord prompted me. He said, "You won't bow hunt this year." I said, but, 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 but God, he said, you can when rifle season starts, but you won't bow hunt this year. I tell you what I did all bow season long. I got closer to God. <laughs> Amen. I got closer to God. God was letting me know you can, you can have, you can have joy in your life. I'll give you the desires of your heart, but I want your heart and I want all of you at all times. As I was walking into that stand, God began to deal with me, and I, I couldn't tell you that day how many deer I saw or, or what really they were. I did some looking. I did some scouting around with the binoculars, but, but every time I picked them up, I had to stop and type something on my phone and, and get, a, get another note or another place for the laden for, for what God was talking to me. And so I, I know that in a scriptural sense, in a spiritual sense, that magnify means to extol, to lift up, to praise, to glorify, to honor. I understand that. But I, but I, I, was, I was puzzled a little bit when he said, remember that thou magnify his work. Now, uh, let, let, me, let me lay a little bit of a foundation here. I, I can promise you that God is no bigger than he's ever been. Think about that a minute. Jesus is no bigger than he's ever been, but down through my life, I have realized different portions and greater details about who God is and who Christ is. So he has gotten larger in my life by my relationship with him. He grows in me, not because he gets any bigger, but because I discover more parts of him day by day and hour by hour and little by little. I'm learning and will never really get to the full depth of who God is. But here the, here the writer said, remember that thou magnifies work which men behold. And then God took me to the mirror. He took me to that spiritual mirror and he said, uh, he said uh, the words to me that, that I could only put in the narrative of my grandmother Adcock. She said, son, you know that your life is the only Bible that some folks are ever going to read. 
And, and I, I remembered that, and you've, you've heard that, and you've said it yourself. And, uh, we're, the, we're the only Bible uh, some people read. So God began to put me uh, in the mindset uh, of what the writer must have been thinking uh, when he wrote this. He said, it is our responsibility to magnify Christ uh, and God uh, to this world. We are the lens that the world looks through. Somebody shout amen at me. Amen. They, they can see him through Hollywood. They can see him through a lot of different prisms and a lot of different lens. But no one will show this world Christ in his purity and his natural state any greater than a spirit-filled church will. Amen. And so we have a privilege, but yet we have a duty as a child of God. I, I have much hope for this generation. If it's okay, I, I'm probably going to go ahead and get over into the youth a little bit because I feel that strongly on my heart here tonight. We, 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 have, we have pointed and said, this one's happened, that's happened, this one's caused this, and that one's caused that, rebellion here, rebellion there, and we've always had an accusing finger pointed at generations behind us. But what about the generation that's leading them? What about the generation that's ahead of them, that's opening up the doors in, in their lives? <clears throat> And God began to deal with me. He said, it is our responsibility to make the works of God illuminated to the world. There's a lost world out there. I don't want to get into a, a lot of the perversion and all that's going on, but you know it's bad. It's terrible. I'm telling you, uh, listen, they can, they can dress up like a cat and meow and they'll call them a feline. I'm telling you, we're in a mess in this world today. I read an article one time. Where there was a there was a church that was called the they they worship colanders you know that you strain lettuce through and had a picture of them with their hands up with colanders on top of their head I thought Lord that's silly that's silly it has always bothered me because people would be would be pulled to antics and silliness over truth that that, that something comes along pops up and and before you know it oh man that's the greatest thing since last spread. How have we missed this? How have we not been, been a part of that? But plainly, the word of the writer said, the psalmist said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. He said, we have a duty. We have a job that we must do. And we're going to do a little bit of illustrating here in just a minute. But I want you to understand that, 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 that the greatest need that I see in the church world today is, is that the church needs to reintroduce Christ to this world. Come on, that we need to once again be the voice that's crying in the wilderness and tell this sin-cursed world that there is a Christ, that there is a deliverer, that there is a counselor, that there is a savior, and he is ready to work in their lives. Amen. Nathan, if you and Layton would help me, if y'all get in your position here. <clears throat> I, I was, uh, as I told you, I, I patted those binoculars and, uh, and, and the Lord began to deal with me about this service. He said, you're going to carry uh, your binoculars to uh, Tyler, Texas. I said, Lord, uh, I got tickled. One of them saw me get them. They said, Brother Marshall, what's the matter? Is your glasses not any good anymore? I said, I'm not that old. Amen. Praise God. But I, I I got those binoculars and I got to my stand and and just little obvious things where the Leighton got a hold of me and I, before I knew it I found myself in a position that I was building a message based on binoculars. Now now you know they're, 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 they're pretty interesting when you when you get into the way they operate they're, they're, there's different size lenses there's different size one is the objective lens the bigger end. 
and the other is the optical lens that goes to your eyes. We know there's adjustment in it. We know there's uh, that we know you can focus it and and bring things into clarity. But as I saw this, God, this is the can I just preach the way God dealt with me about this? Nathan, hold that up back there, buddy. Amen. I want you with your naked eye to turn around and look. And on the count of three, I want you to tell me what's on that ball, on that, that big words on that board. One, two, three. Jesus. All right. People are riding by this church every day and they're pretty sure that this church preaches Christ. Amen. Oh, they've heard enough about you. You can't have the kind of church you have and the town not know something about you. They should never be you. There should never be a time in our community that the church doesn't know where the church is and doesn't know what our mission is as children of God that are trying to win the people to Christ. But when I saw that, God began to deal with me about my conversion. The first thing, I want you to pick him up and look. Amen. Look at him. Look. Amen. What do you see, Brother Layton? Nothing. Why? It's dark. Amen. Brother Matt, that's where I was. I was lost and I was undone. I was on my way to devil's hell and I was slipping through the darkness of life. But then one day at an altar, Jesus came by and he brought me out of the darkness and he brought me into the marvelous light. Amen. I'm telling you, we can't operate in the darkness. Are we darkness in our heart? We're going to have to learn to minister in the darkness, but we've got to be a light and got to have a light burning on the inside of us. It'd do everybody in this house real good if one more time you would fall in love with Jesus at a greater level than you ever have in your life. He'd be all right every now and then throughout the course of the day. You'd at the top of your lungs. I love you, Jesus, with all of my heart and with all of my soul. You see, when I get to thinking about where he brought me from, you wasn't there that Sunday morning that I came into the church at First Assembly of God in Ellisville, Mississippi. I went solely because Ed Mooney told me that they went and ate breakfast every morning together. Now, I can tell you this. He didn't mention nothing about that 45-minute fire heart prayer meeting that they went through before we went to Hardy's. Amen. I walked in there. I thought, Lord, what in the world have I got myself into? Here they are. I mean, they're praying. They're speaking in tongues. And a couple of them have walked by and patted me on the shoulder. I'm trying to pick out the fiber in the carpet. I'm looking down. I won't look up for anything in this world. I'm lost. I'm in darkness. I can't see what they can see, and I'm not feeling what they're feeling. The blanket of darkness is on my life. But about that seventh or eighth morning, hey, I knew they had prayer meeting after that first time. I didn't pray to the seventh or eighth time, but I found out that first time that they had something that I needed. And if I'd get close to it, it just might become a part of my life. And then one morning, when they looked for me to go to breakfast, I was laying on my face between the back pew and the next to the last pew, weeping my way through to God. What happened? Man, them men got to praying. Them men got to worshiping. And they did not make Christ any bigger than what he was. But they began to magnify the attributes of Christ. I saw the attribute of worship. I saw the attribute of praise. I saw the detail of purity and righteousness in God through other 
individual's lives that became the lens that I would look through. So we remove the darkness. Amen. We get the darkness uncovered. Look through them now, Brother Layden. We were not quite there yet. Is it clear or is it fuzzy? It's fuzzy. Only two things can be wrong. Number one, you know, when he brings us, this is a lost art in the church. When he brings us out of darkness, it's not a one and done. It's not that we never have to pray again, but we have to develop a prayer life. We have to develop a relationship with Almighty God. And day by day, we have to make sure that we keep our life clean and keep our life pure because remember it's not so much about us but there's a world going to look through our lives and they're going to see Jesus and what kind of image of Jesus are we presenting to the world are we trying to show them Christ when we're in the darkness ourselves and are we trying to show them righteousness when there's still cleansing that needs to be done in our lives I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. James chapter number one says something that we don't like to hear sometimes. He said, pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world you got to keep the spots off. Come on. You've got to live a life to where you're continuously cleansing the areas in your life that could obscure the vision and your presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Several weeks ago, I, I bought a truck and we were on a trip to Mobile, Alabama. And I came across the Escambia Bay there at Pensacola and there was a, a concrete truck right there ahead of me. And he went off that bridge. Brother man, I saw that rock when he went up off that truck. And I thought, you don't have enough guts to hit my windshield of my brand new truck. But guess what it did? And it put a peck in my windshield. And I, and I did what any good man would do. I procrastinated and didn't get it injected in time. And the first frosty morning came along. And my wife took my truck and went to the store and she called me about halfway to the store. She said, you're going to kill me. I said, I doubt very seriously that's what's going to be the outcome. She said, your windshield just split from window to window. And I said, well, hallelujah. I said, that's my fault. I said, what was a speck? turned into a run because I didn't think I had time to deal with a speck. Can I just tell you what the Lord said say on this Wednesday night? Some of you have got specks in your life that are hardly noticeable to other people. But when the pressure's put on, if you're not careful, what was a little speck can turn into a disaster. Come on. I stopped about 100 miles before I got here and took the blue tape off my windshield because I didn't want to answer all the questions about what happened to your new truck. Amen. I got a buddy in Mississippi. He put a, helped me get a brand new windshield and put in that truck. But as long as that line was there, help me, Holy Ghost. When that line was there, it was in such a place, I either had to look over it or change my posture and look under it. Amen. If you don't deal with the specks in your life, it'll cause you to change your posture. You be looking over something, uh, trying to look under something, uh, instead of having your gaze fixed uh, upon a Christ uh, that does not change. Uh, deal uh, with the specs. I wiped it off. And then God does some neat things. 
God brings us into services and conferences like this, and he brings us into focus. Just hang in there. I'm not in a hurry. I, I, I'm, I, I'm preaching urgently, but I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you get in focus now. <laughs> All right, everybody tell me one more time. What's that say on three? One, two, three. <laughs> Can any of you from halfway up make out anything else on that sign? If you can, man, I need you to find some things I lost a long time ago. Praise God. So that's, there's some wonderful things that surround Christ. <laughs> but the world runs by us and all they see Jesus as is a church or religion or something of that nature. But then God puts his light in us. He touches our heart. He touches our life. He moves in our lives. He illuminates our souls. And then he causes us to be the lens that enhance the details of Christ. I want you to read what's in that upper left corner. You can't see it. Nobody, what does it say? What? Savior. Savior. They ride by and they see Harvest Time Church. But you can show them he's more than a church. He's more than religion. He'll save their soul and bring them out of darkness into marvelous light. I'm telling you, I was on my way to a devil's hell. I knew there was a man named Jesus, but a group of men got to worshiping and got to praising and got to magnify the Lord. And before I knew it, he was, I saw him as my Savior. Let's keep going. What's next? What? Anybody ever had any chains on you that you couldn't get off? When you saw the church and you drove by it, you knew it was a church that preached Jesus, but you didn't know him like you know him now. You, you couldn't explain it like you can explain it now. Oh, as a savior, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. As a deliverer, I was bound in a iniquity. I was bound in addictions. I was bound in sin. But until somebody magnified him, I didn't know he was a deliverer. Somebody came to me and said, hey, God can help you with that. God can set you free of that. I knew he was Jesus, but they magnified him as a deliverer. Let me stay there just a minute. I'm not talking about a feel better. I'm not talking about being good for a month. I'm talking about being free. I said, I'm talking about being free, undone. The chains have fallen off, and I've been set free. I won't go into all of it, but there were addictions in my life. I knew the name Jesus. I started going to church, and I heard testimony after testimony about God that was this deliverer. And before you knew it, I didn't just know him as Savior, but now I knew him as my deliverer. I didn't know that riding down the road. It was the church that magnified that to me. It was my pastor that magnified that to me. It was young men my age in that building that magnified him as a deliverer. What else, Layton? Counselor, you ever have a day when you don't know what to do? And you jump on Facebook and get the latest advice out there. 
you better not. Some of y'all been doing that, haven't you? Amen. You jump on social media and see what the latest thing trending is. And you say, that, that'll help me. I know that'll do it right there. No, no, no. What you need to do is, is find you someone that's full of the Holy Ghost. Get in a prayer room and let them be a counselor to you. And let the Holy Ghost begin to counsel your soul and bring peace into your life. I'm going to say this because when I was praying this afternoon, afternoon. I felt it. You can spend all your money. You can talk to everybody that's ever been through what you've been through. But I'm here to tell somebody that there's a counselor that can explain it all to you at this altar tonight. And if you lay it at his feet and leave it at his feet, he will help you understand. One more, Layton. We got to get somewhere. Heat the furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been heated. I'm mad. Them boys didn't bow to me. But won't he make a way? Didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, sir, we did. He said, that's strange. He said, I see four men loose and walking in the flame. Amen. You know why? When you get in the fire, come on, he'll get in the fire with you. Hey, I said, oh, Jesus didn't stand outside the furnace and say, I'll wait till you get through this and then I'll be your friend and I'll be your help. Jesus said, I'll go right in the hottest part of your life and I'll show you, I'll magnify myself that I'm a God that can operate in the flames, in the flames. Oh, God. Turn the lines out, then we'll open the pit. No, Daniel said, it's okay. I'm just using one of them for a pillow and one of them for a blanket. Everything's okay because God didn't stand on the outside of the pit and say, I'll be here when you get out. God went in the pit and made a way. I come to tell somebody tonight that you feel like your options are over, that you're at your wit's end, but I come to tell you that there is a way maker. Amen. I said there is a way maker, and he's coming your direction to make a way for you. Come on with some more of the laden. I got to get somewhere. A what? It's been said that you only have five really real friends in your lifespan. I'd like to think I got more than that. I've got a stepbrother more like a real brother than he's a stepbrother. But I have a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. I have a friend that I can call on in the middle of the night. I have a friend that when I have failed, he'll help me get up. I've got a friend that when I've lost my way, he'll lead me back to the path. I've got a friend that won't sell me out to the world. I've got a friend that when I'm struggling, he'll get in my struggle with me. He won't talk about me. He won't lie on me. He won't laugh at me because he is my friend. <laughs> He's a friend. Take closer than a brother. A couple of more, Lane. I'm trying to get somewhere, but I just want you to get some of these. Say it loud. Say it louder. Say it real loud. Yes. Anybody here ever had cancer? God healed you. Raise your hand, quick. 
Come on. Everybody had a heart condition, God healed you? Raise your hand. Anybody ever had any sickness at all and God healed you? Come wave them high. Wave them high. You know what you are? You are the lens that magnifies the healer. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. He's a God that can heal. Oh, many of the affliction of the righteous, but our Lord shall live delivered from them all. He is a healer. He is a way maker. He's a blind eye opener. And if they drive by out there, they don't know that. But if they'll look through the lens of our lives, we can magnify the Lord. One more. Anybody in here got the Holy Ghost? Well, you got a little bit. I said, anybody in here full of the Holy Ghost? They drive by that church. They see that sign, but they don't know the power of the Holy Ghost. They don't know that he's a baptizer to them that believe. And the only way they're going to know it is we've got to be the lens that magnifies the baptizer. We're not ashamed. We're not hiding in a corner. We're not trying to be politically correct. We are spirit-filled spirit-led and spirit-driven in the house of God. We, we're not on an apologetic tour. I'm not apologizing for being full of the Holy Ghost. I was in Harvey's, that's a local grocery store, a few days ago, and a sister walked by me I'm just in there in my blue jeans, work shirt. I walked in. She walked by. She said, oh, Lord, have mercy. I thought, I was sort of scared to look around. She said, you got the Holy Ghost, don't you? I said, how you know? She said, I felt it when I walked by you. That's not me. That's me magnifying him. That's me lifting him up. That's me being a lens that magnifies the baptizer to the world. Here's where I want to get to. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Nathan. There's more stuff on that list. You can look at it after church. But we have used the excuse of the spiritual climate the church is in today as the reason why we're not having revival and not seeing the move of God we want to see. Hold up. Jesus is no smaller than he's always been. Could it be that we have focused on some of the wrong things and we have not magnified the true attributes of who Christ really is. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this is what got me. Amen. <laughs> I've heard <laughs> the saints in our church, and I, I thank God for every one of them. We got one turned 85 yesterday, still teaching the adult Sunday school class. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm her substitute, <laughs> and she barely will take one Sunday off <laughs> where I can teach her class. Amen. <laughs> but let me tell you something about her. <laughs> she didn't get in this thing. <laughs> Amen. Just to kind of sit on the sideline and work her way through until Jesus comes. She walked by me the other day in the sanctuary. She said, Brother Marshall, I feel the Holy Ghost moving and something's about to shift in our church and I want to be right in the middle of it when it happens. Amen. Oh, but you look, oh, I got I to gotta say some things here. You look around and seem like we put all of our focus on what the transgender's doing. We put all of our focus on what the little bitty crowds are doing. 
I want to put my focus somewhere else. How many hunters have I got in here? Oh, well, my goodness. Let me talk to you about your lease after church. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. I have learned something about binoculars. When you see that eight times 42 or 10 times 42, that's speaking of the magnification, but it's also speaking of the size of the objective lens. That objective lens is a light gathering lens. The other lens doesn't work unless the objective lens gathers light. Oh, and the Holy Ghost began to deal with me sitting in that stand, and I felt God just get right up in there with me, and he spoke a term into my spirit, available light. I didn't know why, but I got to researching it. Available light also referred to as ambient light is an often unsophisticated light source that is already present in a scene. It occurs naturally from the sun or from the environment and can be used to photograph or shoot video without artificial lighting or equipment. Images created with natural available light can often produce a look that stands apart from photos taken with artificial lighting setups. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. I know the shadows are falling. I know it's getting dark around us. Will you believe that? Can you see around us? But can I tell you this? The darkness has absolutely nothing to do with the effect of the light that is in you and I. He is the light of the world, and we are the light of the world. And as long as he's in the world, there'll be light in the world. Three more things I want to cover. Number one, we've got to use the available light in this world to focus on Christ. You hunters ever been able to pick up that buck in those binoculars when you couldn't see it with your naked eye? You focus on it and all of a sudden, what you thought was a doe standing over there is a fine eight point. Amen. And you wished you had shot it when it walked by you. Amen. Oh, but you know what did that? That objective lens. I'm going to say something here. I want you to get a hold of this. We look at that world and we want to handpick sometimes who we want to give the gospel to. We want to handpick sometimes the crowd we want to minister to. But you know what impressed me about your school of ministry when they was at a church? We've got an individual in our church. They didn't know it when they got around him and started praying for him. But his family doesn't have time for him. The community don't have time for him. But your kids wrapped him up and prayed for him. You know why? They were being an objective list and gathering light. <laughs> They're not going to be like we are. But we have what they need to illuminate the object that can change their entire life. What do we need to do? I've learned in low light, you got to slow down. You got to get steady and you got to scan slowly until you find your object. I'm telling you folks, in the middle of all this filth, in the middle of all this world out here, Jesus is still alive. Yeah. <laughs> 
Layton, you're not going to preach to the generation that I preach to. You're going to preach to ones that have been raised in darkness. You're going to preach to ones that have learned to become accustomed to the darkness. But as long as you're a child of God, as long as you're like that set of binoculars, you will gather the available light. You will be a light gatherer. What about it? In this conference this weekend, Lord willing, I'm going to get to stay the entire time. I wonder if we could leave this conference this week with a bunch of light gatherers saying, I know it's dark, but I'm looking for the light. I know it's bad, but I'm focused on Jesus. I know it's difficult, but my object has not changed, and I'm going to gather in the light. How does it work, Brother Marshall? He is the light of the world. Then he turned right around and said, you're the light of the world. He said, I am the ignition. You are the transmission. I am the igniter. You are the distributor. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. I've witnessed the folks in the last few weeks that I've been walking by for years. And you know what's starting to happen? I'm starting to see some results. You know why? I'm a light gatherer. Hallelujah. I'm focused on Jesus. If they can look through my life and see what I'm looking at and get a clear picture of who Jesus is, he can do for them what he did for me if I will show them the true Christ. I got to hurry. Brother Marshall, what is it? The final result of what I'm trying to get to is this right here. Watch my knees several years ago in a book on ministry. I read this and immediately hit my knees and started praying. He said, the word of God should lose none of its value when it passes through our earthen vessel into the ear of a lost and dying world. It made me get my cloth out. It made me focus my life. It made me get steady. It made me realize as long as he is the light, I am to be a light gatherer and show this world the true Christ. Brother Matt, the true Christ still heals. The true Christ still saves. He's not just a, bu a bundle of emotions that make people shout all the time. So I'm telling you, I, I'll do my share of that. Probably going to do some of that this week if you don't watch me. But you hear me. You hear me. He's bigger than that. Can I just be obedient here tonight? There are people on the sound of my voice, you're dealing with the speck I talked about a while ago. And God sent you here tonight, just a little simple act of coming to an altar, letting God clean you up a little bit. will avoid disaster. If you're not, I, I, I'm going to say this and as the musicians come, I'm, I'm going to say this and we'll go, we're going to get in this altar and pray. A young man came to my church several years ago and raised in that church. He and his wife, precious couple. The Holy Ghost spoke in a service and said, come, let me put you back together. Come, pray. And the word went out, and God prompted me. And I said, I felt the Holy Ghost tell me, you can come, and just you and God will know. And I'll pray with you. Or you can keep going the way you're going, and you're going to be in a million pieces for it's over with. I said, I'll do my best to help you put it back together. But why don't you come now? Six months later, he came to the altar he looked me in the eye and said, Brother Marshall, I'm in a million pieces. Can you help me get back together? It was a speck then, 
but now it's disaster. That battle, that thing you're dealing with in your mind is a speck now. You leave it alone, it'll cause you to change your posture. It'll cause you to look around it instead of deal with it. And before you know it, what could have been averted will become a reality because you wouldn't deal with the smudge on the lens. I don't know why I can't get away from that. But in the process of changing our posture, we also give a fake and false narrative of who Jesus is. That oh, you don't you don't repent, you just look around the speck, everything will be all right. But God said tonight, if you don't want it to be a disaster, let him deal with the speck. Let him deal with that. But here's what I want you to get. I don't pick those binoculars up every time and open them up and check and make sure all the lenses are in place. I just keep them clean. I take care of them. I don't abuse them. And I trust them to work when I pick them up. If you live that way, you won't have to overexamine everything in your life, but you can trust your relationship with God. And instead of trying to dissect everything, you can just trust what you believe and stand on the promises of God. Stand with me across this beautiful sanctuary. There were some other things that I wanted to deal with but here's where I want to settle. Young folks, you have a tremendous privilege to be the lens that shows this world Jesus. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep it clean. You gotta stay in focus. You gotta be steady. But there's people in your circle that you can show just who Christ is and just how I, I picked the binoculars up one day I looked across the field and what I thought was that same little six point I'd been seeing almost every evening was a big old eight point if I kept looking at him with my naked eye, he could have just walked on. But it was the power of the lens that magnified the object. Jesus is no more holy than he's ever been. But let us show this world the details of Christ. Let us show our families the things that they can only see, that they don't see with their naked eye. Let's show them he's a baptizer. Let's show them he's a way maker. Let's show them he's a deliverer. Let's show them he's a healer. How am I going to do that? I'm going to focus I'm going to stay clean. I'm not going to live in the darkness. And I'm going to walk headlong straight toward God. And I'm going to show this world Jesus. I got to say one more thing. Brother Matt, I'm afraid we show them a lot of things sometimes. But young folks, if you could just see Jesus in all of his glory and make up in your mind, I don't want to show the world nothing but Jesus. I don't want to show, I, I wonder, I, I just feel like in my heart, there's some lenses 
that can make a difference in this world. I want the young people first to come stand across front of this building. Come on. We're going to pray. At some point, you'll turn and pray for others. And I want you just to obey the Lord here tonight. I know I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you would like to know you led your friends to Jesus? How many of you have got lost family that you'd like to know it was the Christ that you showed them that they fell in love with? Brother Layton, Jesus is who he always has been. But we need a generation to magnify the Lord. Church gathering behind them. And all I know to do is say, let's have a season of prayer. Come on. I want you to lift your hands up as high as you can. Examine your life while you're doing it. If you need special prayer, we'll pray for you. But ask the Lord to touch the areas in your life. To touch the areas in your life that could hinder the image of Christ that you're displaying. Come on, magna- let us magnify the Lord together. Let's do it together. Come on, praise. Let's show them Jesus. Let's show them the details. So come and be different. I just want to be different. I want to be changed. Till all of me is gone. And all that remains is a fire so bright. There's something different to come and be different in me. And I don't want to spend my life stuck in a pattern. No, I don't want to gain this world to lose what matters. So come and be different Oh, in me I don't want to hear it anymore Teach me to listen I don't want to see anymore Give me a vision That you could move this heart To be Train your plan 
It was your sacrifice that won my heart alive. I won't apologize for needing you. I'll be yours and you are. Oh, I will not compromise. I must have, I must have. If you want to move, move through me. If you're going to move, move through me. Holy Ghost, come down. Pour your spirit out on me. Now, if you want to move, move through me. If you're going to move, move through me. Holy Ghost, come down. Pour your spirit out on me. I can't breathe. 